Hello, everyone. Welcome to our latest installment of our weekly American Moose Our Community Gathering. Um, we've been jumping around a little bit more instead of progressing through the book. We did a, a unit where we did um, truth, and then so much of that conversation had to do with when you should talk, when you shouldn't talk. We then jumped ahead to silence. And now that we've done silence, a lot of silence was like, well, what's the impact going to be on other people? And so today we're going to go back to studying and practicing honor, which is all about impacts on other people. So um, I like this order and I like that we're all here together today. So let's take a moment as we always do at the beginning and do a short meditation. So please relax and close your eyes and take in a deep breath through the nose and hold and exhale through the mouth and hold and inhale through the nose and hold and exhale through the mouth and hold. And as you go at your own pace, <sighs> inhaling through the nose and holding and exhaling through the mouth and holding. Okay. If thoughts should come into your head, just observe them and let them go. Like watching a car move past on the road. Now is not the time for solving problems or for planning. Right now, all you need to do is inhale through the nose and hold and exhale through the mouth and hold. And on your next inhale, say to yourself, Shema. And on the exhale, listen. Shema. Listen. And Shema were listening deeply, without judgment, without offering advice. And Shema will be listening with an open heart. Shema, listen. And when you're ready, you may open your eyes. Mm. Hey, Marianne and Paul and Carrie, welcome. Well, today we're going to begin um, with a check-in as we always do. And if you have kind of a check-in on your journey or your life or your Musar practice, we're definitely happy to hear that now. And also um, kind of our prompt, if that would be helpful to you, uh, I mentioned this in, in the email today, Rabbi Eliezer said, let the honor of your fellow be as dear to you as your own. So I'd like to know what that means to you and how that maybe intersects with your life. So I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna share this quote in the chat box. There we go. Okay, so Sue, start us off. Well, I was going to share. I wasn't going to um, address the quote, but I just wanted to say I missed. What's that? Yeah, please. That okay? okay, so I missed silence last week. I was kind of, or was it last week? Yeah. And then I missed the week before. Um, I was going to share, but I was in Florida both times for my mom who broke her hip and she's 97 and dad's 95. So it's really hard. Um, and they had been living on their own home. They're still living in their own home. 
um, and now we have a caregiver there. And my whole thing about silence, where I went there thinking that I would be, you know, listening with an open heart to my dad, who is going through a lot right now. Mm -hmm. And when he said things like, I lost my wife, I didn't respond, well, no, you didn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, what I mean by silence is not speaking, not trying to contradict or, you know, be respectful for what he's going through and, and say, oh, I understand how you feel, dad. And, mm -hmm. and so that was kind of a, a, you know, that was a success. There were, but there were times when it was very difficult to stay silent when we were doing um, some transactions for banking and trying to get me on the checking account and doing those kind of things. And it was, you know, we had some interactions where I wasn't silent and, and that wasn't as good. So, but I just wanted to recognize that whole thing about um, silence in the sense of realizing what the other person needs at the moment and, and not um, refuting them. So I felt it was good and bad both. It was very stressful um obviously <laughs> but i wanted to reflect on that well thank you sue and thank you for sharing that reflection and it's a so wonderful that you could be there for your parents in that way and what i'm hearing is you were really trying to show up as your whole self and show up for them and to just be there for them and with them and that's a great way of bringing together both science and and honor because you know, the most famous use of honor is honor the, you know, your parents in the Ten Commandments. Um, so thank you. Um, let's all just take a moment and close our eyes and just send Sue a little, little support and comfort and love. Hey, thank you, Greg. Wendy. Thanks, Sue. That was like the most honoring thing I've heard in a long time. That was very nice. And I have to say that this today is a very, um, well, it's difficult because <laughs> I think I'm getting challenged pretty much by this, this um, honor, honor. I love honor. It's one of my favorite traits. And I read the chapter and I have so much to say about it. And I have all this sharing to do, but I have to honor the rest of you and let you share too. So <laughs> I'm just going to share this only one thing with you. I, I took care of my, my granddaughter for two and a half years and I was teaching her Musar, but I, I wrote, um, I wrote all the traits down in, in a way that she could understand them. So honor, I said, when you do what I ask you, you honor me. It is precious to see how you make sure to acknowledge people and dogs that walk by and stop to say hi to snails, bugs, and bees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is so precious. Thank you, Wendy. She's precious. All right. Oh, hey, Laurie. Hey, Karen. I just added our discussion prompt in the chat, although people are kind of freelancing a little bit too, talking about honor, talking about their their journey or their life. So um, Joanne is up next. Yes, and I'm unmuted. Um, yes, yeah, so I think it sort of combines silence and honor. Um, this was last evening bunch of us were going out to celebrate a friend's birthday and my friend Barbara was picking me up and it was supposed to be 6.20 and I went downstairs maybe a few minutes late but she wasn't there, I didn't see her. And I realized, I guess after I left my apartment that I didn't have my phone so I couldn't call her. So I, I walked around and looked for her and then I went back upstairs to get my phone. And in that time she, call, she called me, I mean I didn't hear it. But then I saw it was a message. And uh, so, you know, I do this and I, this is, this is a big fault that I have to work on. Like, so, you know, I get annoyed when, you know, people are, they're waiting for me and I'm trying to be, uh, not be late. And, but they call me just as I'm leaving the house, you know, 
Are you coming? You know, and she left some message like, are you going to, you know, because I was supposed to be there 10 minutes ago, but she wasn't there. Anyway, you know, so I kind of chopped her head up. I was like, I was here, you know, and she says, why are you yelling at me? I'm your, aren't we friends? You know, and I said, oh, yeah, sorry. So, you know, that was like so inappropriate of me and uh, I felt bad and, and she's a lovely person and uh, I could have done better. That's all I gotta say about it. Something I need to still work on. And the only thing I succeeded in, in silence, in, with silence is doing the silent Amida, I realized that like you're supposed to kind of like either say it so softly or mouth the words. And then I found I could read faster if I do that instead of trying to say them out loud, which really slows mm. down. That's it for me. Thank you. Well, thank and you. and thank also you. honoring parents is like, my rabbi always says it's the hardest thing. It is the hardest thing. So kudos to you, Wendy. Yeah. I had never heard that before, but I think in a lot of ways that's true. It can be can be really challenging. And thank you for sharing that, Joanne. And we're listening with an open heart. And we've all we all have the things that we're working on and we wish we could do better. And I always try to think about it as how can I do like one inch better? You know. <laughs> an inch at a time, eventually get there. Stephanie. So I wanted to um, talk about some homework I did from last week. Wonderful. I, I, I wanted to thank Wendy because she helped me um, in this. And um, so I probably am quiet too much. And um, I wanted to start kind of talking more to people, people that I didn't know and don't normally talk to. And um, I have a great opportunity because I teach um, in a senior program. And although I see some of these people, you know, week to week, I don't know much about them and haven't really ever talked much in depth to them. And so all this past week, I just, um, made conversation with them and I I was kind of like blown away how much I learned about all of these people and um and that they felt comfortable enough to talk to me about things that they're going through or illnesses in their family I mean it was pretty incredible and I talked to a gentleman on the elevator who was one of the maintenance guys and had a conversation with him and I just felt like I felt like I was um, kind of just opening up to experience these people and not worried about how I came across or whether I was being nosy or not, you know, asking um, or being too uh, kind of uninterested. I wanted to feel like I was. Um, you know, interest in what they were saying. And I, and I was, they were wonderful people and I learned a lot. And, um, and I even, um, when I go to a senior center, I like to play ping pong and there was uh, some women there that I usually see and talk with them. And they were just all on one side of the room and nobody came over to say anything to me. And I thought, you know what, I should, go talk to them just because they're not saying anything and I should be the one to speak up. And this is part of my homework. So I went across the room, I said, hello. And the first thing they said, oh, I, you know, I saw you over there, but I was too lazy to go over and say, hi, I'm so glad that you came and, you know, said hello. Mm -hmm. So there was just, you know, a lot of good things that I felt from just speaking out more and, you know, th they're, Maybe it's a small thing to a lot of people, but to me, it was a nice way of kind of getting out of my comfort zone, especially with people that I wasn't real familiar with and just striking up a conversation. So anyway, um, I honor Wendy today for, <laughs> for, for get, get, giving me that assignment. 
that That's is all. so wonderful. You were just beaming. You were just smiling as you're telling the story and with so much energy. It's just so, it feels really good sometimes to go out of our comfort zone and it can yep. be scary. And wow, what an amazing, what an amazing uh, set of homework you had. So great it, job. Thank you so fun. much for sharing Thanks. that. Hi, and who's on the phone? Yeah, uh, Martin. Hey, Martin. Welcome. Martin. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share or check in? Okay, well, let's uh, begin our exploration a little bit more. So we're going to look at our assumptions today because I think that this one is important when we're talking about honor. And for Martin, I'll read this out loud. And for all of us, our first assumption is there's a divine spark in everyone which is occluded by our baggage. So we have talked about this, or some of us have talked about it, but it's been a little while. This idea that we were created in the divine image, that that piece of the divine is something that we carry around with us. Um, uh, for those who are familiar with the, the morning prayers, there's an Elohai Nishama, the, uh, you know, talking to God, the soul you have given me is pure, which goes back to the same story of God breathing life into Adam, into humanity. Um, so I would love to kind of hear any thoughts, reflections about this idea of the divine spark and sometimes it getting kind of occluded by our baggage or blocked by our our hurts and frustrations and difficulties that we've been through. And I will say Stephanie is like a great example of like when we step out of our comfort zone, we can kind of move the bags a little bit and that light can kind of shine out and we can connect with other people's divine sparks and really learn about them. Yeah, Marianne. Okay, I'm always very confused by this. So if the soul that God created in us is pure and God is all good, where does the evil inclination come from? Yeah, so you can think of it as like the divine spark is kind of the kernel, and then we have all these other layers and things that are around it and on top of it. And on top of it, we have like the good inclination and the evil inclination. And the good inclination can be kind of fed by, fed by the divine spark. Um, but it can also be fed by like intellectual capacities and other things. And then the evil inclination, those are all of our fears and our insecurities and a lot of our survival um, instincts are things that are kind of part of our biology. So in a little way, it's kind of apples and oranges. I don't know if that helps at all. So, but who gave us the evil inclination? Um, well, if you're looking within like a spiritual realm and a spiritual answer, that's, um, that would be from God as part of kind of the free will. There's a, a saying in the Talmud, which is that God gave us the good inclination and it was good. And God gave us the evil inclination, which was very good. Mm -hmm. And that sort of can tie to when the rabbis trapped the evil inclination, people stopped having children, they stopped going to work, the chickens were laying eggs. So evil inclination is, we need to remember, it's not like the, the terrorist, murderous, sociopathic evil. It's a different, you know, it's, it's kind of the selfish impulses, the self-centered impulses, and the good inclination is the social, the connected. Thank you. You're welcome. Marjorie. Um. Am I, I'm unmuted, right? You are. Okay, thank you. Um, through a, I'm going to refer to Kabbalah. Um, they referred to, it wasn't evil, but it was more of an animal inclination where 
it's used to protect us, like the instinct to, well, if you're going primitive, you know, to kill for food or to, um, it's not always necessarily, like you said, Greg, it's not like, like a killer instinct. I mean, it is in a sense because you've got to kill for food, but it's protection. You know, there are, there are some certain, that animal instinct where you got to protect yourself and, yeah. and preserve yourself. And it, it, that goes, that's pretty, that's a pretty basic instinct. Um, but as sophisticated, cultured individuals, I hope that I have learned to, you know, go about my life in not such a primitive way. And, yeah, you know, thank you. I'm trying to sort out my, you know, I'm trying to say this succinctly and um, yeah. No, I thought that that was good. And I think that's yeah. that's part of the picture because yeah, we have these protective impulses, but sometimes the subconscious can't tell the difference between like a predator or like a time we're really in danger and someone just acting like a jerk in the office or someone being insensitive if that if all of a sudden our protective i'm going to get you for that kind of thing kicks in that's where the information is kind of taking us off track that kind of self-protective instinct becoming sort of hyper Hyper focused, and when we can guide them by the good instinct, it's like, okay, I, I hear that, but let's just take a minute when that comes. Um, is that Linda? Who asked about evil? I think when, it was uh, Marianne was asking about the evil inclination. So, Marianne, when I was in um, seminary, it, it was a subject that almost became a hobby for me. What, where does evil come from? And Greg may already have said this, but the only thing that made sense to me was that we were given free will. And so we could decide which way we were going to go. And so according to this Midrash, I don't know if God actually created evil but gave us the opportunity to to choose thank you linda thank you wendy where is she where, where is she oh marjorie yeah i'm glad you brought up protection and then I, and i'm really glad you brought up choice because in reading greg's book there's a section of it that talks about judging others. And the minute that I read that, I said, oh, judging others can be a protection. But then I'm thinking, we have a choice. Yes, we need to judge, maybe quickly. And then there's this acceptance and this honor. So it's just like our balance, just like the spectrum. So I, I think it's a beautiful thing, actually. Thank you, Wendy. Is it Paul or Carrie? Paul. I took my hand down. I forgot to add to so um, so I think um, I'm going to combine uh, a couple of these things, I think, because I think it's really interesting that the one thing that gets in the way of me honoring other people is my my evil inclination. And that can be the case where um, they say something which they think is funny and I take umbrage at it. I decide that it's a negative comment for me. And so even though uh, they may have meant what they were saying is compliment if I decide that I'm going to take that as an insult instead because it's a I see it or interpret it as a backhanded compliment then okay. that's my evil inclination and <clears throat> the one thing I've been working on a lot is to really focus on interpreting uh, what people say to me where I'm not taking I'm not looking for the 
the, the dark side. Of, I, I'm looking, I'm just accepting that they're just saying what they're saying and I'm not gonna you know, look for anything um, behind that. It's not gonna be a passive aggressive thing. I just, I will accept it. And that they're doing, uh, even if I don't understand it, then they're still doing the best that they can in terms of how they're communicating with me. Um, so that's how I can honor them and also honor myself because that way I can honor my, you know, being my best self, being Paul 2.0, let's say, <laughs> as opposed to all the beta versions that people have dealt with for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at least you didn't get the alpha version. That, right? that would have been a horrible. Anyway. I Thank just you. have this vision that like after every every Musa meeting we get another, you know, 0 0.01, 2 point, <laughs> 0 .1, 2 .0 .2, you know, it's yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, that's that's the new release that comes out <laughs> after Musa meetings. Definitely. <laughs> Very nice. I can tell I've spent too long in Silicon Valley when you know now uh coming out with new versions. Okay. Um, just looking ahead, I don't think. Yeah, no, I do think we'll go. We'll take a look at this, just for a moment, because it's. Uh, I'm going to put up the definition, a couple definitions of honor, and although I think there's a lot of sort of intuitive sense that people have. I also think it's worth just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, could someone please unmute and read this first bullet point? Honor is the ability to recognize the humanity in other people, feel empathy and treat them with respect, dignity, and even with reverence. Right, thank you. So according to this definition, what are maybe some words that stand out for you that maybe we hadn't talked about before or something? And I'll put this in the chat. So you can peek at it again. What's a word from that definition that resonates with you? Yeah, Sue, and then Bonnie. Word immediately that resonated was empathy. And I think we've talked about that before. Um, you know, being empathetic and in the sense of si in what I, we talked about, being silent and understanding the other person's needs, um, or not even mm -hmm. silent, but saying the right thing or active listening. Mm -hmm. And then the other word that it said with reverence at the end, I don't know if we've really... That's an interesting word, reverence. So to revere, to honor. I, so that kind of struck me as something I wanted to think more about. Mm. Um, because the other words, you know, were empathy, respect, dignity. Those I, I've always heard of, but reverence to me that sounds higher somehow. <laughs> like I'm going to revere this person. I'm going to put them on a higher realm. I don't know. I'm. That's just a new a new concept. And not a new concept, but not as familiar. Thank you, Sue. Wendy and then Joanne. I like the word humanity. I just see a lot of little divine sparks all over. Mm. Thank you, Wendy. Joanne. Well, the first thing I, I did, but I think was like a little different was reverence. Also because as was just said, you know, it's like putting people on a, maybe a bug mm. and, um, and humanity also because it, I just saw um, the movie Origin, which talks about basically that it's, it's like not racism, it's not sexism, it's a caste system in all these different areas, you know, even the caste system itself, and but also and and if you recognize the humanity of other people regardless then 
they're on a, at least an even plane with you because you're, you know, because we're human. We're mm -hmm. all human. And then, and maybe reverence because, I don't know, I, I think it's a Christian thing, but, you know, like see God in, in all people or in other people and recognizing the divine spark in other people. And I wish more of that was going around. Thank you, Thank you, Joanne. And uh, I, I'm not an expert on Christianity, but certainly we have in Judaism the uh, Beit Selim Elohim and the image of God. And that is something that we actively talk about sort of recognizing. And that's exactly kind of what you're referring to and what we're talking about here. Bonnie, I've seen your hand go up and down a couple of times. Was there something you wanted to add? Yeah, I did. And then I, um, I, looked at the word respect and I realized I was on the phone today with a representative um, having a very difficult time doing something. And it got to a point where I knew I was going to be. And I said to her, sorry, I'm going to end this call because I don't want to be rude to you, but I'm not, I'm not getting what I need from it. And I'm going to go have another representative. It, it took a lot for me to be able to say that because I'm sure this woman thought that she was helping me, but it was very frustrating for me. I figured it would have been frustrating for her and she's not going to hang up on me, but I needed to end the call. So I don't know if other people have had that situation, but um, I needed to find a way to get out and give her some dignity also. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Bonnie. Now that's a great example, a great example of awareness, you know, awareness of what's going on inside of us. And when we're getting to that point, Paul or Linda, or sorry, Frank or Linda. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm being mindful of, I always kind of understood what the Shema was about, but I think last year uh, with, a, with a new rabbi, he helped me understand it a little better. And and, and it, it resonated with me. Um, and it meant to me that we are all one. Hmm. But that's a tough one. That is a real tough one. And so, you know, that means that uh, how can I embrace somebody who is who is anti-Semitic or a Jewish person who is racist? How do I do that? Or how do I embrace somebody who doesn't want to have a ceasefire in Israel, and those of us who do, how do I do that? And I've been doing some interesting steps here, and I just kind of having dialogue with people who, who don't see eye to eye, because I think only by getting to know the person personally, is it, then it's easier to talk about things that hold, that you hold differently. Yeah. But the idea of that Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Hod, that everything is one is not only so amazing, but it's also so difficult. Yeah, it is. That's what I think of as like graduate level spiritual practice. You know, it's like it's really easy to go rainbows and unicorn. We're all one, and we're all. All of us here in this group of three people who've known each other since childhood, we're all one. Great. That's awesome. But what Frank is talking about, that's like the real deal. And you can come up with even more extreme, you know, examples. And can we be one and disagree? Can we be one and I hold you accountable for actions? You know, I'm going to send you to prison in a dignified way because you've broken serious laws so there's a lot there's a huge huge depth there so thank you 
Yes. Uh, a friend's uncle was an FBI agent. And I had some conversations with him. He was a volunteer in our program. He was a, he was an he was an older person. And this is, goes back thirty years. <laughs> and he had total respect for the people he put in prison. Mm -hmm. Total respect. It, yeah, I just it, it, you know I just it's just for some reason I remembered him. I haven't re remembered him for a long time. Yeah. And he would yeah. he would tell he would tell me stories and about. And he didn't say one single indication of disparagement. Mm. Powerful. Thank you. Okay, let me check the time. We're going to want to get in our breakout group soon. So we'll hear from Karen and then from Wendy. I think this follows on the heels of a few other people. I was just thinking that when it is difficult to honor someone, or when thinking of how to honor is complicated, this is one of those soul traits that is easier for me to understand dishonor. Mm. Don't shame them, don't discredit them, and silence just ties in here. And so if I really don't have a, a way of honoring someone in a specific situation or at a specific time, sometimes the best thing that I can think of to do is just to not dishonor them. Mm. There are other soul traits. I don't think it's as easy to not do the negative, my double negative, but I think it is with honor. Yeah. So sometimes when I get stuck to figure out the whole honor thing, and somebody had mentioned at times it can be very, very difficult to honor someone that you are very close to and who's done a lot of nice things for you, but has also hurt you in some ways. And so sometimes the best thing I can think of to do to honor them is just not to dishonor them. Yeah. I just want to throw that out there. Maybe it's helpful to someone. I think that's very helpful. And it reminds me when I was doing the conflict resolution work for my internship a few years ago, with people with these terrible disagreements, it's kind of related to what you were saying and to what Frank was saying. You know, I might have to say to people, I'm not asking you to be friends. I'm not asking you to agree. I'm not asking you to endorse. I'm asking you to be able to sit at the same kiddish table. You know, can you just eat, have kiddish together and talk about things that have nothing to do with politics? And for some people, the answer to that was no, I'm not willing to sit at the table. But that's like, okay, that's where I would say but you're dishonoring this person if you won't even, they're not even human enough to eat with. Okay. So Wendy and then Martin and then Joanne. That's wonderful. I think Greg's book maybe have shed a little light on that in the very first part of the honor chapter uh, when um, Greg says, babies are not born mean and they don't dishonor. And then it's only somewhere along the line, we suffer humiliation, disappointments, and that can bring us to be mean or dishonoring. But I think how to how to um, possibly um, honor those that we find dishonorable is to think of them way back when they were a baby. They weren't like that. Mm -hmm. Something happened in their lives to make them like that. And and so <laughs> I'm not saying see them as a baby, but they kind of spoke to me when um, I was having to deal with a, a bookkeeper today. And it really helped me, really helped me. I had a great time with her. We ended up resolving every issue. And I said, this works, it works. A so baby is a divine spark wearing a diaper, really. There's not, there's not <laughs> much cute. else there. Very cute picture. Martin. Yeah, um, I see I'm on my phone. Uh, uh, am I muted or unmuted? You're unmuted. We can hear you. Yeah, the, uh, so you mentioned on uh, your introduction about honor. Um, so I've received a, a text message from a woman I know, uh, but it was not addressed to me. It was addressed to somebody else. And in her text that she sent, she's explaining her uh, dire medical condition. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, so I thought, uh, I'm not going to let her know that she sent it to me 
because that could cause her to be totally embarrassed. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to, uh, if she discovers it herself, then she can let me know, Martin, I didn't mean to send that. But that's, that was my uh, uh, mm -hmm. choice about how do I honor her and so let her, so put her in the most possible position for her to feel the most comfortable about what happened. Mm -hmm. If I point it out to her, I think she can become totally embarrassed and this way. Uh, but let, let it, I'm just not going to let her know. That was my idea about how can I honor her the most? <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Wow, another way that honor and silence are coming together. There have been a whole bunch of examples today mm. here. Yeah. yeah. So, Joanne, you get the last word before we go to breakout groups. Okay, so the, yeah. um, the dinner that I went to last night, the birthday dinner, we had, you know, pretty equally divided between uh, politically left or send, uh, left of center and right of center. So we just agreed not to discuss politics, though it we couldn't, we hardly could help ourselves. And so some people who knew the other person who agreed with them talked to them. You know? mm -hmm. uh, but it was hard. And then there was this, a thing that happened. I just briefly, in the sisterhood meeting, so I have a co-president now, thank God, and she's trying to get people especially a certain person that I've mentioned before to, to be kind in their remarks to other people or their messages, you know, email messages. And this person said, I absolutely don't agree with that. And it's like, and I'm looking at her and I'm like, why, you know, but it's like, you can't correct her. You know, she is what she is and she's not going to give an inch in. Uh, you know, evil inclination leads in that case, I think. Because she really is a good person at heart. So, and she's done many good things for the synagogue. And even she wrote something for my father's yard site and it was really lovely, you know? And so, yeah, I could see the good in her. I, I guess I can. But I wish she didn't feel so strongly attached, you know? But people get really... Ooh. adamant about you know not changing a thing you know, i'm not going to do this. yeah, and yeah. We, can't, we can't live someone else's spiritual journey for them and it's uh coming on us to figure out how to address that or how to deal with it thank you okay i'm going to put our prompt in the chat this is from rabbi sheila peltz weinberg from the igs Kumido curriculum she writes, kavod, which is the Hebrew word for honor, is a palpable sense of presence. It is receiving everyone, including ourselves, with a ayin tova, a good eye, alive with divine, ultimate goodness. We are getting out of the way of the relentless critic and judge. So the question is, is it easy for you to judge yourself favorably or to judge others favorably? You know, the same challenge holds, you know, viewing ourselves with a good eye and viewing others with a good eye. So we'll have maybe, I don't know, eight-ish minutes. So enjoy. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. Yeah. We have a few minutes. Would anyone care to share any insights or interesting discussion points that, that came up? Yes, Nancy. Yeah, uh, one thing that was shared, if I say it right, is that, um, well, there were two things. One is that um, non-judging, being in a non-judging state uh, is very freeing and non-stressful to one's life. Oh. Um, and I'm taking two other classes and that's kind of a part of that is judgment is not in the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Once you start judging, you're putting negativity in someone or someone else, uh, something else. And the mm -hmm. other is I didn't like the way this question was phrased. Mm -hmm. I would have rather have seen it as, um, do you judge yourself or others? 
And that's what I'm working on is to just not judge anything. And if something, if a thought comes in my mind, stop it, recognize it and let it go because you don't know what anybody else is going through and you cannot judge. If you start judging, you're judging from a fearful point of view rather than a loving point of view. Thank you so much, Nancy. Wow, that brought together so many things that we talked about. And just what you said, like, how stressful it was to oh, judge no, people. Like, like I felt like this whole like thing in my body. It was like, yeah, that is like I just relaxed when you said well, that. that. Was that was somebody else in the group? That wasn't me, but the other things were from <laughs> me. But, so I want to give them credit, but I don't know, you know, if they want to speak on it. But it was a wonderful conversation. Well, we'll credit your whole group, but you, you <laughs> raised it to the light. So. <laughs> Yes, uh, Janet. I tend to be very judgmental, but then professionally, I've also been a critic. And you can't be. That's your job. If that's your job, you can't just say, oh, isn't this lovely when it when it's imperfect. One of the things I did talk about was the time I had to fire a cleaning woman. Hmm. because She didn't always come when expected. And the way I phrased it to her was, Sue, you're not a bad person. I like you, but I can't count on you. So this is going to have to, I can't use you anymore because if, if I can't count on you, if you don't show up, that, that was the most respectful way I could do this. Yeah. And thank you, Janet. And the question that I'd had, and you kind of answered it was, well, when you're acting as a critic, are you criticizing the person or are you criticizing the work? And that um, example you gave with your cleaning person, you were criticizing the work. It's like the work was not acceptable. And therefore, as a consequence, I'm going to need, I can't use you anymore. But it's, you're a good person and I like you. And so that's, you know, I think there's a phrase uh, in, well, hate the sin, love the sinner. You know, it's like, or with children, you're not a bad person. You're you're acting badly at this moment. Joanne, I hope I remember when it was. I don't know if I said this in the group already, so stop me. But I um, I said in the breakout room, I think when I, you know, I live alone, so I don't even have a pet. And there is something I read about, you know. Women want to have a child so they can blame when stuff gets broken and <laughs> they don't have to blame themselves. But anyway, you know, because the husband's going to be critical. But that's, I have no one to blame me and no one to criticize me. But when I knock stuff off the counter, which I do very, pretty frequently or off the table, when something leaves my grasp, I blame that thing. <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> because it has no feelings and. I, it wasn't my fault. Or if if I, I spill water, I, I said, oh, I guess Hashem is telling me I, it's time to mop the floor. Mm. <laughs> so it, attitude helps a lot. Love that. Thank you. Wendy. Well, I was with Janet, and I just thought that that actually was very loving, a very loving thing to do with the uh, cleaning lady because that could change her life. Um if you just accept what she's doing and she goes on doing the same thing, nothing's going to change and she might not get jobs and she just wake people up like that's not a bad thing. Also, I just want to say about judging, there might be other facets of judging because I think it's really important to be able to make a judgment call when you're in danger and something might be going on. Um, it's because I'm because I'm a grant writer and I'm writing about security enhancements for the temple, and going through all of these webinars about security. So you have to kind of be able to be aware. Absolutely. Not the same kind of judging that that Nancy's talking about, but yeah, different aspect of the word. Sue. The funny thing when in our discussion, what I realized when. Just to answer the question, you know, which is easier for you to judge yourself favorably or judge others? You know, we both thought, oh, well, others, you know, we we judge others more favorably. And I made the comment that I, you know, I um, find fault a lot of times will find fault, but I look highly at others. That's the honor. But then when we got talking about when we have a conflict and we have a disagreement, 
I realized, nope, uh, I'm going to judge myself first because I'm the one that's right and they're wrong. So it, it flipped in the conflict situation, which was very interesting that I didn't realize. Great insight. People we haven't heard from yet today. I know there's a couple of you who haven't spoken. I just want to give you a chance if you want to share anything today or add anything before we, we say goodbye. Okay, no problem whatsoever. Um, then let's take a moment, and I've kind of enjoyed doing the silent meditation the last couple of weeks. So let's let's kind of stay with that, stay with that vibe a little bit. So please relax in your seat, and close your eyes, take in a nice leisurely breath. Nice, leisurely exhale as we close our sacred space with a minute of silence. <sighs> And when you're ready, you may open your eyes. <laughs>